happening and a lot going on, but this this event, you hear that? Jesus is, is clapping too with the thunder, you know what I'm saying? Um, the goal and the purpose of this is for you parents to be comfortable with what your, your students are experiencing on a Wednesday night. So that you know who I am and you're aware of what's happening. Um, this is usually how it goes. We have a game or, or something fun for the students to do. Then we'll do about 20 minutes of worship. We'll do about 20 minutes of me speaking and then 20 minutes of small groups, which we'll go to here in just a little bit. So I figured, you know, since we're doing parent night, we might as well do some parent and teen jokes, right? Who wants to laugh? Who feels like laughing? No? I do. They, some people say that, um, some people say teens are just children old enough to dress themselves that they could just remember where they last put their clothes. You know you're a parent, parent, when your teen comes in and says to you, it's nerd day at school, can I borrow some of your clothes? <laughs> you know you're talking to a teen when you start every conversation with, take your earphones out, put your phone down. <laughs> one day a teenager asked her mom, how, uh, one day a teenager asked her mom, how about you get tattoos of all the names of, our, of the children? And mom responded, I already do, they're called stretch marks. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight I want to talk about the dynamics of the family, the dynamics of parents, the roles and responsibilities of parents, but also the roles and responsibility of teens. So teens, I'm going to lay it down to you first, and then I'm going to go and lay it down onto the parents, okay? The very first thing that the Bible teaches young people to do, it's so important that God listed it in the top five of the Ten Commandments. And that was to honor your father and mother. This is found in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, if you want to read it with me, it's here. Honor your father and mother as the Lord your God commanded you, then you will live a long life. Anybody want long life? Yes. A full life. Anybody want a full life? Yes. In the land the Lord your God is given to you. This is the first command with a promise. And that promise is long life. Something that everybody wants. No medicine can help you. The one way God tells you that you're going to have long life, and this is a promise from His, is if you obey your parents. And students, I understand, honoring your mother and father can be difficult. Right? Let's be honest. It can be difficult. But just because it isn't easy doesn't mean we cannot do it. Life is full of you having to make choices to do hard things because they were, are beneficial things. Anybody in here like eating your vegetables? Any of you guys like eating your fruits? Anybody, anybody like doing exercise? Any of you like going to a job and earning money to pay your bills and buy your clothes? Yeah. You say you raise your hand to like it. Ask me again in 10 years when I ask you that question. You're all going to be saying you hate that. Listen, life is full of opportunities for you to say yes or no. There are going to be a lot of easy yeses and a lot of easy noes. But this is one of those hard ones. And you have to make the conscious decision that I am going to honor my father and my mother. And I know how it can be. Teenagers, your parents make you mad and under your breath you utter... I hate you. But can I, can I clue you on a, on, in on something? There are times in our lives that we as parents don't like you much either. And if you're ever walking into a room and your mom and dad are talking and you walk into the room and they stop talking and they look at you, it's because they're talking about you. Jesus is the only teenager that knew more than his parents Jesus is the only teenager that knew more than his parents, yet he submitted to his parents, honored his parents, and respected his parents. And if Jesus is the one we're supposed to model, and if Jesus is the one who we're supposed to become like, and if Jesus did it, we should do it. If the king commanded it of us, then we should obey him, because that is what he has called us to do. Number two. Not just honor your father and mother, you need to affirm and appreciate your parents. 
Proverbs 3.27 says this, Do not withhold good, do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it's in your power to help them. You guys all heard the story of the Good Samaritans. For you, though, who don't stick around long enough, we'll teach you about it. But each one of you have had a moment and an opportunity in your life to do something good. How many of you decided not to do it and you walked away because you didn't like that person? Yanni, did you do that once? Maybe? No, Joanne, maybe? JJ, you're being honest? You're being honest? If there are times in your life where you had the opportunity to do good and you refused it because you didn't like that person. There are times in your life where you're not going to like your parents, but you need to appreciate them and you need to affirm them. One day, a young boy came in and told his friend, my dad works 12 hours a day. He buys me toys and new clothes. I got a new iPhone, a smart TV, a Blu-ray player, and a PS4. My mom, she does all my laundry, grocery shops for me, cooks all my food. Wow. His friend looked at him all confused like, bro, sounds like you got a gun, man. What, what is wrong? He's like, what if they tried to escape? <laughs> Y'all's parents do more for you than you realize. And if you would affirm your parents every time they cooked you a meal and said, thanks, mom, that was delicious, or dad. Thanks for going grocery shopping for me. Thank you for putting clothes on, clothes on my back and giving me a bed to sleep in. Thank you for having internet at the house, Mom and Dad. Thank you for having cable. Thank you for buying me this phone. I tell you what, after your parents get off the floor from passing out for your kindness, they will do more for you. You get more with honey than you do with vinegar. Affirm and appreciate your parents because there's some kids in this room who don't have parents. They would kill to have parents to be angry at. There are kids all around this world in adoption and foster homes that they wish their parents were around to give them heck and, 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 be, and, be, and, and be grounding them, doing good for them. If you have parents in this room, after we leave tonight, I hope you go up to them and tell them at least one good thing that you're thankful for for them. You need to affirm and appreciate your parents. Honor your father and mother, affirm and appreciate them. That is your role as young people. Now let me lay it down on the parents. Parents. <laughs> Jesus, I know. I'm going to take it easy on my promise. <laughs> parents, train with purpose. Parents, you have the most important responsibility in the world, and that is not just raising your child to be a good citizen. It is to develop them to become disciples of Christ. God did not give you children to fulfill your dream, your purpose, or your family name. He gave you children to fulfill his dream, his purpose, and his family name. Ooh, that was a lot better than I reacted to. Proverbs 22.6 says this, Train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are older, they will not depart. Which means, parents, your child is a product of your training. You are the greatest influence of life and faith that they have, so use that influence wisely. Don't let society teach your children how to act. Don't let social media and TV teach your children about sex education. Don't let their cell phones be the only way to communicate effectively. God gave you those responsibilities, so take them seriously and purposely. A couple years ago, I heard of this law called the Law of First Mention. Is if parents, if you, that, that young people's mind is so unique and fragile because of technology that they will believe the first thing that somebody tells them about a subject. So if they hear something that they never heard from you or anywhere else, they instantly think that is true, and they hold on to that truth until somebody can prove it otherwise. It is like a concrete fact. The power of first mention. Parents, if you're not mentioning sex first, your kids already know about it. If you're not mentioning how to manage money first, your kids are already learning about it. If you're not setting up boundaries for dating, your kids have probably already heard about it. Education, uh, I won't get into this too, serious, too deep because that's not my notes, but 
but kids are exposed to pornography and sex now starting at the beginning of age of eight. Children are becoming addicted to pornography between the ages of 10 and 11 for males. Females, it's a growing number of between from the ages of 12 to 15, girls is coming at a larger rate of 30 some percent when before it almost never existed. It is a real deal and if you're not the person who steps in and teaches your student, who trains up the student in the way they should go, they'll follow the ways of their friends, society, TVs, movies, music, apps, and anything on their phone that they can reach. The best thing that you can do for your children is to give them roots, bring them to church. Get them in their word. Turn off their cell phones. You know, if you want to have a family meeting, the best way to do it is turn off the router in your home and sit in the room where it's located and your children will come running. <laughs> Not the internet now. Mama, I don't know where to go. Did you pay the bill, Mama? <laughs> your brother, did you be like, <laughs> we need to talk. <laughs> Boom. That is so funny. Number two, you produce what you are. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is one of my favorite. It's right after the, the, uh, Jesus, uh, God lays down the law to Moses. And he tells them this in verse uh, chapter 6, 6 through 8. It says, And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands, being the Ten Commandments, that I have given you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you are at home and when you're on the road, when you are going to bed and when you are getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them around your foreheads as reminders. The primary means of training is how you live your life. You produce what you are. God told Moses, Moses, you first must take in these commands and follow them. And then once you have absorbed them and learned them, you must now train them with your child wherever you go. Whether it's going to the store, taking them to school, sitting down watching a movie, asking them, do you think God would be okay with that? Watching a movie, a TV show, saying, would God appreciate that? How can we love God more? How can we serve God more? They will learn far more about how to live their lives from how you do than your lectures, especially if your lectures don't back up your life. Do what I say and not what I do will, will create teenagers that do what you do and hate what you say. If you don't prioritize faith, they won't. If you don't prioritize church, they won't. If you don't prioritize serving, they won't. If you engage in inappropriate material and entertainment, so will they. You produce what you are, so be what you want your children to be. This is something that when I was, when I became a daddy four years ago, it was something that was in my head, in my heart. As, as a father and not a pastor, let's take that little off my, my mantle for a minute and just put my daddy wool back on. I wanted to be the best father for my girl so that she could be the best mother for my grandchildren. I want to lay a foundation for my children that they will go higher and farther than I ever could, but not just financially, not, just not, not in prestige in this world, but spiritually. Everything in this world fades except for what we build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how good your student is at sports if they don't have a relationship with Jesus. It doesn't matter how pretty they can sing to the pop music if they don't know the, God, the word of God. It doesn't matter how much money they make if all they do is waste it on the world and nothing for Jesus. If you don't teach them how to prioritize, if you don't become it yourself, they're going to look at your life. And every time you tell them to do something, they're going to look at your life and say, you don't. Why should I? The best way to correct your child is to become the correct example you're showing them. Ask yourself, how's your language? How's your behavior? And do you match up to your own rules? And when you begin to live it, your student will begin to live it. And when you both are operating underneath the commandment of what God is giving you, honoring your father and mother, appreciating and affirming them, training them up with purpose, producing what you are, all of a sudden some of the problems that you're experiencing in your household will begin to drop and some of the production that you've been missing in your household is going to rise. John Maxwell calls it the law of trade-off. If you want something else, you have to give something up. I always, tell, I always tell students, you're always busy with something, 
But what are you going to choose to be busy with? Parents, you're always going to be busy with something. You have to choose what you're going to be busy with because what you choose, your student, your young person, your daughter, your son, your grandchildren are going to choose what you choose. And if you want them to be better aware than you are, then you need to become better than what you are. So that you can push them to go farther than you ever could think or imagine. I'm going to end it with this. Proverbs 23, 22, 24, and 25. I'm skipping 23 because, you know, there's already 23 in there. So 23, 22, 23, 24, 25. It'll be a little confusing. I understand, I understand that. Numbers are hard. Math is hard. <laughs> Why do you think I've become a pastor? I can't do math. I said, Jesus, take some loaf of bread and he made 10,000 people. I like that. I don't know how that works. I'm not I'm bad at that. 22. Children, listen to this. Listen to your father. Listen to your father who gave you life and don't despise your mom when she is old. Let's just stop there for a minute. <laughs> Where's my boy Dante at? Now he up in the world ring. I know Dante knows this first because he writes this out all the time. If you want to become smarter in your life, you need to read a book of Proverbs. Young people, you need to listen to your father. And number two, don't look at your mama and ever call her old. Don't ever say that she got wrinkles. Don't ever say she don't look as good as she used to. I will kick you out of my own house if I hear you do that. Don't despise your mom because you're getting old. Don't despise your daddy because you're getting old. You know why? Because the older they are, the more smart they are than you. Listen to your father. Don't despise your mother. Next verse, verse 24. The father of godly children has cause for joy, and what a pleasure to have children who are wise. Another translation says this. Parents... Rejoice when your children are doing well. Parents, too many times we can be the ones who are saying, no, 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 you didn't do it right. Don't you listen to me? What is wrong with you? What is happening in this world? When your parents, when your kids do something right, affirm them, love on them, praise them, praise them. Let them know that you care. Let them know that you care. <clears throat> and when they turn out well, Respond to that well, that way. Because wise children parents become proud parents. If you want to leave a legacy that's going to outlast your days, raise wise children who will become proud parents and wise parents. Because this is what's going to happen. Your father will become happy and your mama will become happy. They'll become joyful and happy because of what they produce. Parents, I know that the most important thing in your life is to have children that are, that are not just good citizens, but are disciples of Christ. Amen. And so during parent night tonight, it's only my affirmation not to beat you down. It's my, it's my job to affirm you and say, you're doing as best as you can. I understand that. But I'm asking you to challenge what you're doing. Is, are you doing the two things that matter most in their lives? Are you training them with the purpose to become Christ? And are you producing who you are. And if you are producing who you are, is it what God wants them to be? And more importantly, what God wants you to be. Young people, if you're causing strife in your home because you're not honoring your parents, stop it. God isn't happy with that. Don't pick on your brother and sister just to make them mad at you. And then get in a fight with your mom and dad and then storm off and say, I hate you and slam the door. There's no unity in there. There's no love in that. God didn't say that. God said if you want to have a, a long life, but most importantly, a full life, which means joyful, happy, blessed, expanding in your territory, being productive, then darn it, obey your mom and your daddy. It's not always easy, but if you do it, God will bless you. And then affirm them. Be appreciative of them. Because when you do, they'll pour out more of themselves into you. And together, you guys will rise up and be all that God's called you to be. So tonight... Normally, parents, what we would do after this is I'd have everybody stand up. So everybody stand up. You're looking at guys more on the floor. Who was complaining? You got to be appreciative of what you got. No, I'm just joking. Just joking. Just joking. 
Normally we do a more, a more evangelistical message would mean more, I'd be talking more about Jesus. So here's my Jesus tidbit of this all. I mentioned it earlier. If Jesus could be obedient to his parents and he knew more than his parents, yet he humbled himself to obey him. And that is who we are supposed to be like. Let me tell you one more part about Jesus and why you want to follow him. Jesus was God and came into earth. He willingly died on the cross so that you can live forever. And he did it without the guarantee that you would love him back. Jesus put himself on the cross without the guarantee that you would be here tonight. He went up on the cross without the guarantee that your friends, your family, the people at school, the people in the entire world from the beginning of time to the end of time. He had no guarantee that you would say yes to him, but he went on the cross anyway. That's love. And if you never, ever, at any time, any moment of your life have ever asked Jesus Christ to be Lord in your life, there's only one way that you get to heaven is that his name is his. You have to cry out to Jesus and say, Father, forgive me. Be the Lord and Savior of my life. That's the only way you get to heaven. It's not about how, how good you are. It doesn't matter how many good works you do. It's not about karma. It's not about heritage. It's not about your money. It's not about your looks. It doesn't matter about anything. Unless Jesus knows you when you take your last breath, there's only two alternatives. That is heaven and is hell. And I don't talk a lot about hell because there's no need to. Because when you tell somebody that they can win the lottery, $700 million, but when they die, they're going to win more than $700 million. They're going to live eternal life where there's no more sadness, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more rust, no more cuts or bruises, no more stitches or concussions, no more breaking down cars or breaking down homes. It's all gold. It's all jewels. And it won't even matter because the biggest jewel that we'll ever have is being able to see Jesus face to face and knowing throughout eternity we'll never have to suffer again. But you have to know him as your Lord and Savior. So tonight, if you've never asked Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life, I want you to bow. Everybody bow your heads. If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life, you say, Ryan, I know about Jesus. I come to church a lot, but I've never said Jesus be my Lord and Savior. If you've never done that yet tonight, you feel the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart to do so. I'm going to count to three, and I want you to raise your hand high and then put it back down. One, Jesus came to die for you. Two, the Bible says he's the way, the truth, and the life. Three, if you call upon him, you shall be saved. There's one hand. Anyone else? Two hands. Anyone else? Anyone else? Two. All right, everybody lift your head up. There's two people in this building who's never asked us and they made the decision that they didn't want to follow Jesus Christ. Our name is the tribe, and because we're the tribe, we do life together, we pray together, we strive together, we serve God together. We are a family. So these two people ain't coming into the kingdom by themselves. We're going to help join them. So I want everybody to say this prayer with me out loud, and then we're going to rejoice afterwards for these two people to welcome them into the everlasting, eternal home of a family called the family of Christ. All right, so here we go. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross. Just for me. Thank you that your grace and mercy is new every day. You will never stop loving me. And I promise to never stop loving you. Become Lord and Savior of my life now and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody rejoice.